What drives men? Put very simply and directly, what could we say after the first couple of years when someone develops, up until they develop what seems to be a personality? <laughs> that they're, they're past the absolute minimal survival level and they develop what seems to be their own, or begin to, their own individuality. So after that, for two decades, Plus or minus. You could say that what drives people then is sex. The sex drive. Then, let's say for the next decade, what could you say would drive a man, a person? And it all, obviously, or should be, obviously, would overlap. But the next ten years, what you would generally find, or what we could say that you would generally find, is people are driven by their hobby their dream that you want to be a famous ballerina, a writer, a musician. Yeah. After that, we're then getting close to 30, I mean to 40, let's say. After that, what drives someone? And we're still talking about ordinary, sane, civilized people. Yeah. How about Habit and resignation. <laughs> We're talking about the sane, ordinary people now. The middle class of the world and of history. Habit and just resignation to habit, to life. To find someone, even at the ordinary level, past that age, still excited, still determined to do something is so extraordinary that they can, that they will pop up on talk shows or in feature articles and magazines simply on the basis that somebody's 50, 60 years old, not the ordinary level, and still attempting to accomplish something. Such as guys 60 years old still trying, still out every day practicing for the uh, triathlon event, still trying to still claims he hopes to break the world's high jump record, even though it appears to be impossible. Or even a guy that uh, is he's 50 or 60 years old, and he's working on his 200th novel. He's never had one ac accepted. <laughs> and I don't mean they bring on such a person or write him up just as a joke, like, well, look at that old fool. It's on the basis that it's extraordinary that someone's still attempting to do anything beyond the level, the drive that I was describing as a combination of habit and resignation, at the ordinary level, it is very unusual. Beyond the ordinary level, it is a strange thing, it is a curious phenomenon indeed, or if I may say so, indeedy. Beyond the ordinary level, for someone to be past those first, especially three decades, an attempt to be doing something, still actively attempting to pursue something, and it's not at the ordinary level. This normally falls under the classification of uh, making such pursuits as uh, some sort of, let's just lump it again for easy descriptions, as some sort of mystical intent. Uh, a man attempting to fulfill himself spiritually. I'm using the ordinary description still. A man attempting a little more out of the mainstream description. People have historically attempted to describe if they are still active to any degree past that age of habit and resignation. The middle age set downs. The middle age sit ins. Set ins. Uh, they described it such things as attempting to you know, expand their consciousness, attempting to clear their sight. There's some kind of mystical sight. All of those are still the same thing that a man is attempting to do something with his nervous system past the point. Habit has given up. Mechanical growth has bypassed him.
it has moved on to another generation. He may yet be alive, but at the age more or less of 30, when, if you remember the little description I was giving, let's say past the first couple of decades, sex is no longer, put simply, the driving force that's running him. Many people then become 40 years old at the age of 20. Many people then fall directly into habit. They don't go through the second stage I was describing, second adult stage, the second non-survival stage. Some of them go directly from that into habit slash resignation. But many do continue on for at least another decade or so, pursuing their dream. The dream when I put in the arts, like in music and dancing and such as that, there are many people that just want to become successful, famous, powerful, rich. It's all the same thing. But somewhere after that, you notice most people give up. They may still go to work and they may still pay their mortgage and they may still get haircuts and stay in reasonably good shape, but they are no longer pursuing any sort of dream. In other words, nothing apparently is driving them any longer. They just go through the motions. They may be friendly. They may be your neighbors. They may be your relatives. God forbid they may be you. <laughs> but nothing apparently is driving them. And I do not mean in a clinically psychotic manner somebody being driven. It's just like one day you turn around to somebody, if you want to look at somebody else, and it's as though they're now living on autopilot. They may still get promotions. They may still make investments to make more money but what seemed to be the fire that was driving them to get rich, or the fire that seemed to be driving them that made them dance all the time to be a famous ballerina and move to New York or do whatever, or work only part-time at menial jobs so they'd have more <coughs> available time to work on their novel, to work on their symphony. Just one day it's gone. By the same token, any serious question intellectually spiritually, whatever ordinary people want to call it, the questions about what is life and etc., leaves them at the same time. It stays around no longer than what I'm describing. If it does, it's as exceptional as the people who are still 60 years old and attempting, out practicing and planning, threatening, promising to try and break the high jump record. If anyone is still out attempting to in some way fulfill themselves at a non-survival, non-physical level, mystically, some way like that. They are as unusual. But there's something beyond the ordinary level because that's named. It becomes systematic and just because even at that apparently fairly unusual level of someone being past the second or third decade and still being apparently driven to try and fulfill themselves non-physically somewhere in here or in there they think. If they're doing that you will ordinarily find that it is in some systematic form. The hazard being, even if they make it that far without dying, without the fire going out, they, over 99% of the time, and I won't deal with any fractions, but over that, <laughs> they will only end up dealing with something that has a name, that is systematic. The hazard then being, that the name of the system becomes the system. <clears throat> to refine that from last time, men believing themselves, insisting to themselves, if not others, that they are still on some quest, some unusual quest, and being able to define it, being able to name it, reaching some age beyond 30 or 40 and saying, well, now I have a clear idea of what it is. I think it's as though, I think it's close to the Tibetan myth of so-and-so. I think it is now, I begin to see it as a kind of expanded version of what a true Christian would be internally. Something like that. They then take the effort. They then take what they claim to be the verbalized, the nameable aim, and they take that as being the unusual effort. They take that as still being the drive that they will go to some meeting, they will continue to buy books that have a name or they refer to some systematic 
description that they have accepted as being in line with their aim. That, that's not curious enough. That's not strange enough. Because even though you would apparently, from some external view, be fighting, be attempting some unusual activity, if it's systematic, and the name means anything to you, especially much, I wasn't going to get off, but you do know that for an ordinary person, for an unusually, for an unusual ordinary person to be pursuing something out of the ordinary, such as some kind of mystical, spiritual, conscious, expanding effort, whatever the name of it is, they take very seriously. You must. You must. Even if it's just a little secret word, perhaps, among you and a few dozen or hundred people that seem to be pursuing this, the name of it. The name of it may be the founder of it, but the name of it is going to be, uh, if not superfluously holy, it's going to be important. So important that they do not realize how important. To be able to keep up an unusual quest that is not harmonically driven, a quest that you should, that the fire, the drive of such a quest should have gone out, all but went out, and everyone when they were at least 30 or so, for those of you past that age, it should have gone out. It down there did. To keep it up and not be now part of a systemized activity, one in which the name of it is important, that begins to meet the true criteria, I submit to you, of being strange and curious. And if that does not meet the criteria or your understanding of strange and curious, I was going to try and bring out this huge mirror. And I was going to prop it up right in front of me when I got to this point and, and fall into a dramatic silence and see if you... <laughs> Series 93105, items 1 through 45. A man said, if I had a name for it, I'd try to do it and was told if you had a name for it, you sure couldn't do it. Anyone who believes that men are the source of their thoughts will believe anything. A creature can possess higher mental functions and still be neurally and still not be neurally alert. Man's normal consciousness is nature's only hurricane in which the center is not still but rather flabby. <laughs> Since men cannot determine who hit them, they like to point to their bruises. <laughs> the first sounds men heard from the creative source were not words, but rather warmth and light. Why miss must be verbal and understanding not. Uncontrolled thought is not conscious thought. What you automatically do, life tells you, is conscious thought. There is no high ground in flabland. <laughs> the soft condition of ordinary mentation is one out of which a thinker cannot simply waddle. <laughs> the way you can tell that something is physically alive is that it moves. And it moves because it feels. And it feels because it eats. What can you tell about a creature mentally? The alert's only comment regarding everyday affairs should be no comment. <laughs> new science, a new view. Once men developed telescopes and could see beyond their own, own solar system, they were done for. Don't waste energy looking for the source of your thoughts, but rather ponder the origin of all thinking. To diligently investigate the irrelevant keeps ordinary minds properly misdirected. And, I might add, the intelligentsia reasonably sane. Think archaic, speak archaic. But no matter. Think archaic, speak modern. <laughs> Solar life is just as agreeable as you are. In fact, more so. Where do you think you got it from? After the initial whirlwind, a few men sought out a fresh center and new high ground, while some of the ordinary and simplistic imitation built monasteries. A man's mind told him, 
I am too busy to be alert and mindful. And the man asked why, and his mind replied, I don't know. <laughs> the ordinary find anything unnatural annoying. A thinker finds his own natural mental state the height of so. <laughs> a new kitchen, a new recipe. There is no nourishment in a stew continually stirred. Remember this, men, said one... Remember this, men, said one man, one man to some man. The fate of the world doesn't depend on us. Physically, the fate of you doesn't even depend on you. Mentally, an alternative future is just barely within your grasp. Genealogy, cosmology, and the natural order of verbal sequence. Sons don't speak. They force fathers to As he struggled with his mental situation, one man thought, Help! I'm being pulled down. Except that it's not actually down, but rather sideways in all possible directions. Addendum. Mm -hmm. The alert never say, Help! The ordinary, with their ordinary mental hungers, will stand in the serving line and discuss almost anything, <laughs> such as man's soul, man's spirit, his cosmic potential, Almost anything to keep from having to deal with the ever-present bowl of gelatin. <laughs> For the mindful, life sends out a daily alert each and every morning. The ordinary find anything unusual irritating. A thinker finds his own mental condition supremely so. Physically, we're all part of a web. Mentally, each man is the center of himself. Truth. Physically, we're all part of a web. Mentally, each man is the center of himself. Kind of. One man thought, I can do magic tricks. I have a vaporous bowl of jello that can talk. <laughs> Man's mind will not die till the gases are finally all burned. That which man has created is all he sees fit to critique. Those who believe men create their creations will, after all, swallow it all. Can't read my own typing. Those who believe men create their own creations will, after that, swallow it all. Man's development of physical space travel is a prelude to what's to come. The ordinary find all unnecessary effort aggravating. A thinker finds his own disinclination to pursue so, extremely so. <laughs> The center of the storm. The secret is at the center of the storm. The secret is at the center of the everyday storm. Once you find the right word for something, you can put it on it and then forget it. <laughs> Unmindful mentation has a plan, even if you didn't plan it. What do you say to that? Myths are a stall for metaphors. Metaphors a cover for symbols. All targets misrepresent the nature of the bullseye. The alert, how but one nemesis? Inner jello. Man is the only puzzle which, when disassembled, reveals no more than it did originally. Man's mind is the only puzzle which, when disassembled, tells you no more about it than you knew already. Anything commented on 
is usually of no more but the briefest of value. Another economy, another view. We're all on charity. The alert's grandest call for help is no comment. Without feeling, no thought. Without food, no feeling. Without metaphors, a straight shot. Alertness needs no verbal support. How curious it is to look so close and see so little, but look far away and see so much. For most diners, menus metaphorical are too and specific, while those direct, indigestible. The alert do not eat from this planet. All heroes get burned to a crisp if they do it right. The alert should be alerted by the fact that you cannot sit on still on something hot. <laughs> Starting over now to see. Since men cannot determine who hit them, they like to point to their bruises. Could we not come up with some kind of quick award to give to this one? As this makes, which does it make look the best, metaphors or symbolism? Since men cannot determine who hit them, for those of you that prefer this, men cannot determine what hit them, according to how much you want to personalize the particular unpleasantnesses you seem to have concerning life. Men who cannot determine who or what hit them like to point to their bruises. How about the hell with metaphor and symbolism? We're back to all human institutions, all systematized forms of we're here to help you. We are a man's friend. Our name is church. Hear me howl. Yeah. My, my name is school. Listen to me roar. My name is psychiatry. Pay me. You're too much behind. I know it's less and less necessary to talk about suffering, although everyone, I guess, can be physically suffering, but that's not what this is about. But the rest of the suffering, you know, the feeling guilty about being alive, the feeling guilty about not succeeding, feeling guilty that uh, you don't love your parents enough, feeling guilty that you love them too much and depend on them, whatever it is. Should I reverse it and say men love to point to their bruises based upon the fact that they can never determine precisely where they got them? Do you like that better? Rather than making or leaving anyone, which would be wasting your time, you can't blame it on me, uh, attacking or feeling that there is some problem with everything from religion to marriage counseling to psychiatry to everyday psychological attempts to understand the nature of man. What is it besides pointing to your bruises? And an ordinary mind might go along that far and go, okay, okay, okay. Waiting for the rest. What rest? They say, well, we only talk about our bruises so we can. We only talk about our symptoms, our problems, for one reason, assuming that we're still reasonably sane. And that's so that we might ultimately do something about it. Ultimately? Did, you, did somebody say ultimately? <laughs> is that that word that sometimes spelled the same as never and nobody seems to ever realize it? <laughs> you know, bypass all the humor and the smart-ass stuff 
And realize, all talk about problems is what? Right there. It's pointing to your bruises. On the basis, for the reason, for the fun, having no alternative, but pointing to your bruises on the basis that men never can figure out where they got them. Never is a lot more inclusive and revealing than ultimately. <laughs> Even hopefully, finally. Because, see, well, at the ordinary level, that's what your mind must think. That I am in counseling or I'm just involved in self-reflection. On the basis that I do want to understand where I receive these bruises. And I am making headway. Headway? Did somebody say headway? <laughs> are, we, are we in the same verbal ballpark? If you have any idea what the verbal game is. I mean, this is a bunch of you sissies still trying to play softball or that you know, hockey sack or, you know. We're talking about hardball. It's all, you're in the same ballpark. Say, so, well, ultimately, eventually, gradually, working up on it. Uh, routine targets will, uh, will misrepresent the true nature of what a bullseye is for all minds. And as long as, well, I was going to bypass some of that. It stops all questions. It stops you from wasting time if you're trying to still pursue something out of the ordinary. That there is anything to be learned as to where you got your bruises. That seems to be open to such debate. As long as man's been talking, he's been debating that. It comes down to the most inclusive modern version is probably heredity versus environment. Your grandfather's idea of good and evil, etc. But you can bypass the question of perhaps it will reveal something. Maybe we're getting somewhere. Maybe if I change tact. If you understand that the whole point of pointing to bruises, not physical bruises now, not survival bruises, not threats to physical survival, but the pointing to all other bruises is simply on the basis that they can never, their source can never be identified. Notice, for the sake of clarity, to save money in the verbal, the linguistic, the alphabetical marketplace, I am bypassing gradually, maybe, I submit, possibly, I'm telling you, Nobody has ever, nobody has ever figured out where they got their bruises. Never. You would think, in a sense, to renege on my pledge and go back to a bit of smart-ass dramatics, you would almost think that reasonable people somewhere along the line would have been standing around and somebody said, you know, they're discussing their bruises in life. Perhaps on a very educated, sophisticated plane. And one of them says... And they're both well-read, know a bit about history. And one of them says, you know, us sitting around talking about our psychological flaws, our bruises, yeah. You know, as men's always been doing this. Oh, yes, I'm sure of that. And he starts quoting some scrap from a vase fragment that they found just outside <laughs> of what is now Ethiopia, Mesopotamia. Yes, people have always. That's been people, people have always been wondering that. And that guy goes, well, I got a new wonder. Nobody's ever figured out squat. What the hell are we doing sitting here 5,000 years later and we're replaying the same thing, looking hopefully, I, every now and then over our coffee, I'll glance up as the sun's going down. We've been here in this Waffle House for five hours. <laughs> <laughs> the sun's setting. I'm beginning to see my reflection. I can see us over there in that far front plate glass. And I see us sitting here with our cigarettes, you know, the ice tray piled high, and us still looking, our hair getting a bit, and us looking very thoughtful. And I look up and I think, we're taking this so seriously, and we believe it. Not that it may not be an enjoyable hobby now, sitting there doing it. <laughs> but for them to go, and the man says, and I realize we might as well be. Here we are, dressed up, sophisticated. You and I both went through, you know, postgraduate work in college, spent all that money. 
we're doing the same thing that people that didn't even have a grammar school education, much less a grammar school, 5,000 years ago, <laughs> they were doing the same thing and they got nowhere. And here we are doing it again and going, hmm, you know, pondering, meditating, musing. You would think that somebody would have said that, right? Of course, wrong. But I bring that sort of thing up again to point out how obvious everyone else says that they're involved with wanting to find the truth and understand, etc., when it's obvious that they're not. That's not part of it. That's not what of ordinary man's description. If I want to understand where, why I'm like I am, where I got the bruises, I want to understand the nature of life psychologically, because they don't really care scientifically, biologically, like I was pointing out, any more than people care what happens to them when they die physically. They don't care. They don't care more. Look at the way they live physically. They don't have to care. They're not made to care. You don't have to care. Life will look after you. The city. Earthly conditions will make you live physically just as long as you need to live. If you don't, you know, all you got to do is look around. How people live, if you're an ordinary person, you think, my God, look how people overeat and look at all that cholesterol. And look at them people smoking and drinking. How old are you, sir? 85. <laughs> well, you're an exception, maybe. <laughs> Life will make you live. Life will support you physically as long as you need to live. I notice no one ever asks, oh, I'd send you back to church or temple. That, you know, is there a chart somewhere that has your name that says that you're listed for you? Know, 68 years, 4 months, 27 days. <laughs> People only care about themselves non-survival at the non-survival level, the non-physical level, here. That's what they discuss, and that side of their discussion can never see that the discussion goes nowhere. <laughs> the discussion itself is the hobby. They take the discussion as being some form of progress, which is the same hazard I was describing as taking the name of an effort, I said a system, but I can change it for you, the name of an effort as being the effort. Yeah, well, never mind all that. I've given up. I no longer am that concerned, says a man's mind, over being rich and famous and powerful. I won't be dirty enough to stop in the middle and say, well, how old are you? <laughs> anyway, he says, I'm beginning to see through some of the shallow, callous, vacuous goals that other men pursue. How old do you think he is? Guarantee is not 18. I'm again to see through that. I now, I would like to spend some time, some of my free time, not just golf and other neat things, but perhaps take a course in philosophy over at the junior college at night, or perhaps even rent a, they have videos on psychology there or something. Maybe read a book. Now I'll rent a video on psychology or philosophy. They take that, and I'm not making fun. They take that if they would go buy a book, if they would just say. Many people won't make it fly this easily. I think I'm going to spend more time, now that I am no longer as concerned with my business and getting rich, I think I'm going to spend some time now being more reflective. That's what I'll do. And his wife or somebody says, well, yes, dear, yes, dear. Yes, that's what I'll do. I'll be more reflective. I'm going to slow down, not just my business hours or with the shop or with the factory. I'm going to try to slow down and kind of smell the philosophical roses in life. Good, dear, good, dear. He goes, hmm. He goes on about his business. That's for those of you that never did like the story I told you years ago about a guy that you know, said he quit smoking. And he'd bum a cigarette off of you. And it wouldn't do to so I thought you quit smoking. He'd say, well, I did. I told you that. What are you going to do with somebody like that? Of course, you're ordinary. I guess you're going to end up in some kind of verbal fist fight with him. But he had it down. Well, I told you I quit. Come on, give me one. <laughs> yes, I'll be more reflective. That's what I'll do. I'm going to start thinking deeper about life rather than just getting mad and angry. I'm going to start thinking about things. Good, dear, good. That is good. You see my bowling. Where's my new, where's those new golf clubs I bought? In other words, just selecting the name. 
just deciding I will investigate this. Mm -hmm. Just threatening to. Yeah, I quit smoking. Give me, you got to smoke? Give me a cigarette. I thought you quit. I did. I thought you were going to be more reflective. I said I was. I stood right here in the kitchen. I told you, remember, two weeks ago. I was looking out. I remember it was a real warm day. And I'd been having those pains in my side. And you know, I told you I was going to slow down. And I was going to start being more reflective. I told you that, didn't I? Well, yesterday you did. But I thought, well, I told you I was. You can give me a cigarette. All right. The talking about bruises adequately misdirects people's minds from the fact that no one has ever determined where they picked them up. And don't let an ordinary mind, even one lurking in you, say, wait a minute, they have sometimes because I saw somebody on TV, they were interviewing him, and he said that the reason he was an alcoholic now was he remembered that he was sexually abused as a child. Well, that, that blows this item right out of the water, right? <laughs> Other than that dirtiest of all questions. I was going to make a joke about something from a quiz show. The dirtiest of all questions. I'm an alcoholic, says the man, because my uncle or my aunt sexually abused me as a child. <laughs> the dirtiest of all questions, and that's dirty enough, I guess, for mixed company and decent people, but there's a dirtier question. What made your aunt do that? I'm sorry, Oprah, but I only have one lifetime. I don't have to... <laughs> I don't have time to go into somebody else's problems. She should, shouldn't have done it. They've got you. The ordinary flow of public life has got you on this planet. Institutionally, collectively. Because, and I threw in the last part, I've never heard anyone say that because it wouldn't go over at all. Uh, the Bible's tried to take up for it. Well, I'll read the scripture somewhere. Uh, the Western version, I think, is the sins of the fathers, the past, the sins of the sons. And I don't know what all the hell they've done to it. It wouldn't be hard. I know, they've, I know that they have refried it, put it under some heavy gravy, if not sedation, and made something else out of it. But that, that is the same thing as saying, well, I know where I got my bruises. You know, forget you and your old cheap, you know, item number five, series 93105. Forget all that. I know where I got my bruises. It was from my mother. Let me tell you, my mother used to beat me. I mean, she had her clock set for three times a day, and she would pull out this heavy stick and beat me. Right? So, so he discussed his bruises, and we go, well, you know. But then they question, not with ordinary people, but if you were trying to understand something, if the people involved were, the question is, then, well, all right, that's why I'm an alcoholic, or that's why I am you know, psychologically crippled and bruised myself, is because of what my mother did. I mean, that's not a mother. That was some kind of monster. Okay. Why was your mother like that? Why did your mother do that to you? Do I have to go any further? It breaks down, which is why it's not pursued. I mean, it's not supposed to be pursued. It would put a... Serious rip in the web that holds physical life together on this planet and holds ordinary people together mentally. You cannot go any further with that. It's not because people are dumb. It's not because they don't have an answer. It's not because I can make them look bad. You could do it. You can stop to anybody. You can do it religiously. I mean, that, it's easy to do. If somebody was seriously presenting to you the story of uh, original sin, vis-a-vis -vis the Western idea, the original debt you owe to life, that God made you, gave you free will, and told you a couple of things not to do, and damn if your parents didn't turn right around and do it. Oh, well, wait a minute. Could I ask a question about what you just said? Well, they'll say, well, certainly, because you might join up. But there's one question you can ask, and it's the same one I'm asking now. Well, why did your mother do that? Well, wait a minute. If, if the gods did so-and-so, if they made man such and such way, 
Now, wait a minute. We've got, we got to go back one step, and i got to ask you, well, how do you explain that? There is no explanation. And so, therefore, the question is, everything from unchristian, uncharitable, unreasonable, untoward, unacceptable, and normally unsaid. You just can't ask. And yet, once you see it, it is the question. I mean, once we looked at the guy's bruises, and he tells you how harmed he has been and beat up by life. Nay, not by life. I can't say that, says he. My mother. I might as well admit it. I'm going to tell you outright. Well, my mother did it to me. And it just begs for the question. If you're back at an ordinary level and just intelligent, it just begs. All i got to do is hold it up, and I've got no program, no agenda, so you don't have to resist it. And I just say, doesn't that beg one question? After we all go, well, geez, you know, that's a shame. You know, I don't like to hear about it. I'm sorry it happened to you. And he's there trying to be intelligent. He wants you to intelligently join along in his, you know, pointing to his bruises. Maybe perhaps you'd make some intelligent, sophisticated aside to it. Oh, oh, oh. But if all the people are just intelligent at some ordinary level, somebody has got to say, would you ever wonder, you know, what made your mother do that? Well, no, I didn't give her any calls. No, I'm not saying that. But you said that she just, as far as you can remember, she just would suddenly just turn around and just hit you and beat on you. Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay. But that's not normal, is it? I mean, that's not what we call a normal person. Well, no, I don't guess. Well, you know, how'd she get like that? Why the hell should I know? At best. At the absolute best. If you want to see some progress, I guess, you could get people nowadays would say, well, she one time before she died, she, she sort of said, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly sure, her father mistreated her. <laughs> oh. And that's the end of that. I mean, you'll be lucky to get that far with people. Now I'm saying with people, you'll be lucky to take the web the network neurally that holds humanity together on this planet and pull on strings that are tied to other parts of the net going back one step. Well, why did your mother do that? You can just barely do that. But to pull on it and make them go back and know and like, well, I think her father mistreated her. That's it. Your string has run out. <laughs> and yet, what's more reasonable than that? <laughs> from one view. And of course, then you'd say, yeah, but that's getting unreasonable because after that, then you've got to start saying, well, wait a minute. What's going on here on this planet anyway? What's all this story about good and evil or which is of the greatest importance, if not supreme importance, heredity or environment? My mother beating on me or whatever made her do it. That is not an operational question. Once you understand that, then everyone's complaints, including your own, all religion, just all normal human activities, and especially that which nowadays seems to be of some specifically psychological, of some specific psychological importance, such as men talking about their bruises, discussing them, whole new areas of psychology opening up, self-help groups, the whole thing. You realize they're pointing to them, and there's an easy way to describe it that is not misleading, that I have done. They point to the bruises on the basis that they do not know where they came from and will never know. <coughs> what is she going to talk about relative to that? What is she going to say? And I could also point out, that assuming that people subconsciously, unconsciously know that they'll never determine the source. Let's get that out of the way. There's no question of they unconsciously know that. Life knows that. The web of life that now runs man neurally on this planet is not wired up so that that knowledge will ever be available. The reality of it's available is where the whole idea of an unconscious came from. People saying, say, well, I don't know. My mother, I feel like that probably she loved me, but there was some kind of, I don't know, subconscious. Something in her drove her to do it. And nowadays we accept that in the same way that hundreds of years ago somebody would say, my mother mistreated me, but there's no doubt. I mean, she was a fine woman. I'm sure that some way in her heart of hearts she loved me, but some kind of demonic spirits got into her, just evilness got into her and made her do that. And people would go, yeah. 
Nowadays, ordinary people, most of them would scoff at that. Ah, oh, come on. But if you said, well, how about this guy's mother? How she, how she mistreated him. And by many other observations, she was a fine person, member of the PTA. Nobody in the neighborhood knew it. How do you explain that? Well, she obviously, I mean, I don't know the particular case, but she obviously had some kind of subconscious traumas, something subconsciously in her would make her strike out and harm her own child that she loved. And now they should go, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a real problem. What problem? What the hell are they talking about? I'm telling you what they're talking about. It's the awareness that they don't know what's going on, so they'll talk about the bruises and point to them. It's the awareness of reality. It's the point blank awareness of reality. And yet people, once you're past the point of nonverbal consciousness and you're into the point of verbal mind, mentation, you've got to talk about something. And you can't go back and talk about that which was not actually extant before you could talk. You can't go back and start describing the barren plane of consciousness with the structure that it can now talk. Because now it can talk, it's not barren. It goes, Jesus, this makes me dizzy to think about. You know, it seems like we go around and around in circles. Oh, really? You mean something like a, maybe a merry-go-round? Where have I heard that? I don't know. The sins of the father is the horse right behind you, right? Well, yeah, except I look up front. And damn if that doesn't look familiar. Well, sure it does. It's life. The whole idea of a subconscious drives making people do things that would appear to be otherwise insane and people who are otherwise sane, like your mother got by as a, being a decent person and yet was beating her son on a regular basis to the point that he now has bruises that he says has interfered directly with his life, with his, so, with his mental and social health. And they say, well, that's a subconscious drive. What they're saying is they're aware that life does not fit verbal mouths. Everybody's aware of it. It's nothing subconscious. They call it other things. They call it irony. They call it the folly of life. But the thing is, they realize that reality, silent reality, fits no one's paradigm. It fits no map, no church's map, no institution's map, no university's map, no human's map. Some of them seem to get close, and then they drift off, and then you drift off. But no map, no description matches reality. The blueprints will not match the building, not perfectly. So what used to this? So oh, that's the work of the devil. That reality doesn't match the way things should be. And now it's subconscious drives of some sort. That being the case, what else are men going to do regarding the bruises, regarding that which seems to be their own shortcomings, their own, I'm talking about from their view, not from our judgment. People say, well, I'm certainly not a perfect person. I'm not even satisfied. I'm not even minimally satisfied with what I am psychologically. But there are reasons. What are they? Well, look here. And I said, what's the reason? Well, look here. Let me show you this. Let me tell you about it. Let me tell you how bruised, let me tell you how it's interfered with my ability to have good personal relations with people of the opposite sex because of what my mother did to me. You got some time? Sit down here. Bring us, bring us a pot of coffee, waitress. They're going to point to them for one reason. Because they, they know subconsciously. Now, do you follow it? They know that they'll never identify where it came from. Which is why you can't say, well, wait a minute. You hear their story and say, wait a minute. I, I believe all that. Now, I'm sorry as hell to hear it, but what do you think caused your mother to do that? Forget that coffee, waitress. There's nowhere to go with it. I mean, the person feels like, well, I was, I was going to sit here and open up to you. I, I was going to point some out some of my real personal bruises to you, and now, now you're getting kind of snotty or something. What are you, nuts? What are you, un are you subconsciously nuts? Of course, the real answer is no, I was consciously interested. I was consciously curious. No, nah, that's too weird. We don't, we don't have that kind of sh shit on this planet. You know, go somewhere else. Okay, item five. Only 41 to go within seven minutes. Here we go. The first sounds men heard from the creative source were not words, but were warmth and light. Second part, which I don't think everyone heard last time. This is referring to this. This is why myths 
must be verbal and understanding not. What are all myths? Words. No, nah, don't be crude. No, nah, I wouldn't be crude. No, nah, don't be flip. I wouldn't be flip. And then you could say, an ordinary man can say, well, hell, everything you talk about is words. No, 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 you missed it. Myths must be verbal. And understanding not. That's why you must talk and discuss your bruises. That's the myth. I've been bruised by something. That's the myth. Evil spirits. My mother's behavior. Remember, not physical bruises. That's the myth. If you didn't talk about the myth, what would you talk about? Nothing. This is why myths must be verbal and understanding not. All right? You may tell you the world's greatest myth. The myth that encompasses them all. I could, but I can't put it in words. Man's normal consciousness is nature's only hurricane in which the center is not still and quiet, but rather is flabby. <coughs> there were a string of these. I assume that some of you heard them put together. And there's more to them, just the direct eight or ten words that make up each in this series, within the series. The alert's only comment regarding everyday affairs should be. The only comment regarding everyday affairs. Anything that could possibly happen. Bruises. Where they may have came from. Come from. The alert's only comment regarding everyday affairs should be. No comment. I mean, that's for the record. Somebody, a real alert thinker, you will never get any more than that out of him. Of course, you wouldn't get that out of him, but I had to say something. That's the myth. But whatever it is, my God, man, you look bruised. You look singed, beat up. What happened to you? We're all concerned. What happened? My good man. No comment. A new science, a new view. Once men developed telescopes and could see beyond their own solar system, they were done for. <coughs> Have we got too many people now that feel defensive about science as people did hundreds of years ago about religion or 50 years ago about psychology? You know, if I was doing this 100 years ago, I'd had to have been concerned about, you know, if I'd said that same thing about religion. Once man developed, once man developed religious myths and could thus in their soul, in their mind, in their spirit's eyes, see beyond their own solar system, they were done for. A hundred years ago, people were going, rah, 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 rah. where's Cardinal Fang now that we need him? Bring back the Inquisition. What's wrong with you? Then 50 years ago, if I'd said, once men developed the concept of psychology in the subconscious and could thus see beyond their own solar system, their own immediate environment, they were done for. Then I had people going, suddenly pulling out their you know, pro Freudian society cards and you know, beginning to mumble amongst themselves like, should we lynch him? Time to a burning couch. Some kind of poetic justice. <laughs> but now it's more science. I mean, because is this not insulting? I mean, assuming that I was serious in it, that's not just some kind of demented joke. Once men developed telescopes and could see beyond their own solar system, they were done for. What are, are we going to relive the trials of Galileo? <laughs> Have we regressed like that? Not hardly. A short wrap of the general things we were just talking about. Item 13, to diligently investigate the irrelevant keeps ordinary minds properly misdirected. And I might add the intelligentsia reasonably sane. 
Now, where's the intelligentsia? They can join right in because they'd be part of the scientific community normally. They could join forces and take umbrage at this one and the one about telescopes. A man's mind told him, I am too busy to be alert and mindful. And the man asked why. And his mind replied, I don't know. I think we should love, leave on a conclusive, all-inclusive, <laughs> if I may say, strikingly explanatory note such as that. I'll repeat it one more time to, for dramatic effect and to take up the last minute on the tape. A man's, man's mind told him, I am too busy to be alert, controlled, determined, and focused. And the man asked, why? And his mind said, I don't know. <laughs>